hope, help, and healing with a hint of humor, HashimotosHealing.com. All right. Hello, people. I'm Mark Ryan, licensed acupuncturist herbalist from HashimotosHealing.com. And today we're having a discussion with my buddy, Mickey Trescott, who's up in Seattle. Hey, Mickey. Hi, Mark. Well, welcome back. I heard you were traveling uh, back to the East Coast and uh, promoting your book and doing some other cool stuff. Yeah, I, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately. It's been really exciting um, having the opportunity to teach people about food. It's really taken off um, because the elimination diet's really helping a lot of people. Yeah. So it's really fun to have the opportunity to collaborate with other people, and we've got some exciting stuff planned for the future. Yeah, and congratulations on the hard copy of your book. I saw some of the pictures, and I really am excited. I can't wait to get a copy. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to share it with you. Yeah. Well, cool. So I wanted to start out today a little bit. If you could just give a kind of a brief, you know, recap of your story, and particularly, um, you know, your experience with Hashimoto's and, and uh, what led you to creating the cookbook and, and really embracing this diet and this lifestyle. Yeah, well, um, a few years ago, I, w I had been vegan for a long time. I was always really interested in health and nutrition. Uh, I thought a plant-based diet was the best thing for me, and I was very healthy on that diet for a few years. And then I started having some problems. I went to my doctor, you know, some preliminary testing, um, specifically about thyroid. I, I asked about thyroid. He said I was fine. I still had symptoms and it kind of progressively got worse and eventually I ended up finding a doctor who diagnosed me with Hashimoto's and celiac disease yeah. um, but he also said you know avoid gluten obviously you have celiac disease um, your thyroid is normal even though you have a, an autoimmune thyroid disease mm -hmm. um, so we'll just wait until your thyroid's worse and then you can have medication and everything will be fine well what happened was I got worse, <laughs> even though I stopped eating gluten, right. and everything wasn't fine, and I lost my job. I was in and out of the hospital with all kinds of various problems, had all kinds of testing. You know, at one point, they thought I was developing other autoimmune diseases, um, but finally, I, I thought about the diet piece in a different perspective and thought maybe I was missing some critical nutrients, maybe what I was eating wasn't optimal for my conditions, um, and I came across the autoimmune protocol, and it was not a clean switch. It was definitely over a period of a few months, um, maybe six months total to just really start eating meat again, start working on my digestion, um, pulling out all of these foods that were causing inflammation in my body, doing reintroductions, and I made a full recovery um, over the last two years, which has been really incredible. And so now I write and I teach, um, and I really am impassioned to help people figure out the food piece, I guess, in their yeah. chronic illness. It's really important to me. Yeah, it's wonderful, and, and your story is really inspiring for, for many, many people, I think. Let me ask you a quick question. You know, why do you think the veganism or vegetarianism is not necessarily so helpful in this healing process? With well, I mean, it, the idea of eating a lot of plants is actually very healthy. Plants right. have a lot of vitamins and minerals. They have a lot of fiber, which is really good for um, cultivating the beneficial bacteria in our guts. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, with a plant-based diet, you need to get protein somewhere, and your only options are beans and grains, really. Right. So, you know, nuts and seeds do have some protein, too, but they also have some of the compounds that beans and grains have in them that are actually make them not the most nutritious foods you could be eating. Right. Um, beans and grains aren't the worst thing in the world, but especially for people with autoimmune disease, they do have compounds that cause uh, leaky gut to worsen, which I know you're going to talk about in a little bit, Mark. Right. Um, but they're just not optimal. So maybe for a healthy person, they could tolerate them, but for someone with autoimmune disease, they're just not the best thing they could be eating. And so animal foods, um, all, they actually have a lot of the vitamins and minerals that are needed to repair connective tissue, to regulate hormones. 
I mean, cholesterol, which is the building block of all hormones, comes from animal food. You can't really get it on a plant-based diet. So a lot of people, they avoid cholesterol thinking that it causes heart disease, but really what's happening is they're avoiding the building blocks of their cell membranes, of their hormones. So you know, when I started having problems and I started looking into this issue, um, it, it kind of started coming together as the vegan diet was just not nourishing me in the way that I needed to be nourished in order to yeah. heal from this chronic debilitating illness. Um, and when I looked into it more, I found that meat is actually not as problematic as I thought it was. You know, there are ways to get meat that is natural, sustainable, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, grass-fed, and those animals are perfectly healthy to eat. Um, right. I, I think it's a critical point. I, I think, you know, so much cholesterol has been so vilified, mm -hmm. and and of course, statin drugs are so profitable that it's really created this, you know, perception for a lot of people uh, that the good fats are not good, and mm -hmm. boy, are they important in this population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, if you consider a more traditional diet, even, you know, muscle meat is just one part of, of the animal, you know, and... You know, there's a lot of other nutrients in connective tissue, maybe in like a fattier cut of meat or, you know, bone broth made from the bones and the joints. Um, glycine is an amino acid that is really high in organ meats and in bone broth. So even just breaking out of, okay, eating meat, but actually varying the types or the parts of the animal that you're using, um, those were all really new concepts to me. And... I definitely didn't go from being vegan to eating liver. <laughs> you know, it's been a big transition. Right. But I respect that those foods have been a part of our traditional culture for a long time. And we need to recognize that that actually has a lot of nutrition and they have a lot of components in them that are very healing, especially to bodies that are trying to, to heal. Right, absolutely. I could not agree more. I think it's a very, very valid point. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, the autoimmune paleo diet in respect to leaky gut mm -hmm. and how it helps uh, to heal that? Well, um, the autoimmune protocol removes all foods that have been showed to, shown to be gut irritants. So these are all foods that cause intestinal, intestinal perme permeability or leaky gut. Right. Um, so they include grains, beans, eggs, nuts, seeds, and nightshade vegetables, which are tomatoes, peppers, spices derived from either of those, um, a couple herbs like ashwagandha is a nightshade, tobacco is a nightshade, um, and it's a family of vegetable that has a poisonous quality to it that most people are not sensitive to, but people who have this leaky gut, um, they've been shown to be one of the largest triggers of it. So, um, so you remove all of these foods, and it doesn't necessarily mean that for every person with autoimmune disease for the rest of their life, they're going to be sensitive to these foods, but they have the highest chance. So we remove all the foods for an elimination period. Um, I usually go for at least a month. I think three months is better, but pretty much as long as you can handle... Um, and really in that time frame, you want to be 100% strict and you want to feel better. So over the course of that time period, if you start feeling your joint pain improve or your sleep improve or maybe you're happier than you used to be, you don't get headaches, you know, it doesn't mean that all your symptoms are going to be resolved, but feeling better is a great benchmark for reintroducing foods and figuring out what makes you feel worse. So in the reintroduction, you start with a certain food and there are lists that I have in my book of foods that you introduce earlier and foods that you introduce later. So like nuts and seeds, for example, are eliminated because a lot of people tend to be sensitive to them um, as an allergy, but they actually don't cause leaky gut. And they're removed just as a precaution, just because a lot of people tend to be sensitive to them. So they're the first thing someone could add back. And they'll want to add them back one at a time, slowly, systematically, over a period of uh, a few days, just to watch to see what kind of symptoms they get. Yeah, uh, I think that's a critical point. We want to, in the reintroduction period, we want to do it one at a time. Yes. 
because there is quite a bit of variety between different types of nuts and different types of seeds. Mm -hmm. So some, mm -hmm. some of them are, are like better tolerated spices. than others. I'm sorry? So that includes seed spices. So right. if someone wanted to introduce cumin, you know, they need to do just cumin. They don't, they're not going to go make a curry with cumin and cardamom. They need to reintroduce those two separately on two different occasions to see if they work. Same thing with each type of nut. So the reintroduction process can take months, right. but it's really good to know, you know, I, I've worked with people who are sensitive to pepper or, you know, who are sensitive to cumin or are sensitive to almonds, but maybe they're not sensitive to walnuts. So right. it's really interesting and it's really good to be thorough and careful um, in that process. Um, and then once you move on from kind of the uh, easier to reintroduce foods, you can move into, you know, foods like eggs, you know, egg whites, a lot of people have problems with and dairy is another um, uh, nightshades, I think, are the last thing people should reintroduce just because nightshades tend to be the most problematic. Um, but it's, it's a personal process and people just need to get in touch with their bodies and kind of look inside to see what works for you. And if it's not clear, maybe leave it out for a little longer and then try again. Um, but over yeah. the course of this process, you end up with an ideal diet that best supports your healing process. Right, exactly. Actually, it's funny. I've been sort of playing around with this idea. You know, like the traditional paleo has the 80-20 principle mm -hmm. where it's like 80% you stay on paleo and then 20% eat whatever you want. Like, obviously, we can't do that. No, no, it's 100%. But, right. But what I was thinking, like, within the, you know, obviously it's the things in this area that we know we can eat. As we do the reintroduction process, what I've found has worked for me personally is that's basically where I live the vast majority of time. Mm -hmm. And I'll occasionally step out and try things, do that. But whenever I'm not feeling well, or whenever I'm having a flare-up, or whether something's not right, I will go back yep. to that 100% that thing. Totally. I just wonder, do you do anything like that? I do. Yeah. I would say that I'm on a modified autoimmune protocol. Yeah. I know what I tolerate all the time, and I know what I tolerate sometimes. Right. And like eggs, for example, you know, I've been doing this for a couple years, I was unable to reintroduce eggs until I had been on the autoimmune protocol for a year. Yeah. And then when I reintroduced them, I couldn't eat, you know, a four egg omelet every morning. I right. could eat a four, well, actually, I would eat like plantain pancakes that have like one or two eggs in them once a week, you know, as part of the batter. Right. And then I gradually would do maybe twice a week. And then I started eating like a couple fried eggs on top of greens. Um, and then I worked up to like an omelet, but for now I, for the most part, avoid eggs unless right. I just, you know, want to have a special occasion, maybe brunch with my friends or something. Um, but I don't necessarily think that I'm reacting to them. It's just, it's a safe place, you know? Right. And I, I think, yeah, I, I do something similar. Like I, I do eggs just on, on special occasions really. Mm -hmm. And and really about, for me, it's like I know there's a kind of sweet spot of when I feel my best. And really, mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time, I've, I just like, that's where I want to live for the most part. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. And yeah. a lot of people think that living this way is overly restrictive. And they think, how could you possibly live the rest of your life like that? But when you've been in a body that feels terrible, it's like you don't want to live the rest of your life in that body. And for right. me, being healthy, I would rather, I would do anything in order to continue that health, you know? So I think you have it exactly right. You kind of, you live in this area and you, you figure out what it's worth to you, you know? Right. There's a couple things that I will admit, I'm human, I like chocolate. It doesn't right. like me. So every once right. in a while, having a little piece of chocolate is worth the reaction I get from it. And I'm aware of that and, you know, it's right. fine. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for someone just starting out. I think it's really important to be really strict and just kind of go through the foods so that you really have a clear sense of what you can tolerate and what you can't. Right. But once you've been doing it for a long time, you can kind of figure out when it's okay to go to a restaurant and try to make it work or when it's important for you to keep all your meals home cooked. Maybe you're not feeling well, you know, get lots right. of broth. Um, kind of be in more control and tighten it up. Right. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a great way to handle it, and that's important too for people to see that there's there's some flexibility within this. But it, even within, you know, what analogy I like to use, it's like some of the greatest paintings ever painted were painted with very few colors. Mm -hmm. So in the I same way, that. and that's what I love about your cookbook. Mm -hmm. It's you know, yes, it's restrictive, but within that palette, you can mm -hmm. create wonderful masterpieces. Oh, there's pieces. an unlimited amount yeah. of foods. Yeah. You know, and, and they're all very exciting, different foods. I mean, if you think of it in terms of chicken breast, broccoli, and coconut oil, it's boring, right. you know? <laughs> but when you think of, of, like, eating bison or duck or rabbit or, you know, a lot of people aren't very um, into exotic proteins, and I get that. But there's a lot of ways that if you do get bored, you can say, well, I want to try pheasant or quail or, you know, all these different vegetables like kohlrabi or yucca or taro. Or, you know, you can really go there. Right. So there's a lot of options. Yeah, there really, there really are. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of practical things. I think that this is kind of a good segue into that. One of the things people often will use as an objection or, or you know, something from, from really going uh, wholeheartedly into this is that, oh, it's just too expensive. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, a lot of people say gluten-free is too expensive. I mean, really, if you're cutting out grains, that's a lot of the expense of being gluten-free. So yeah. you're eliminating expense there, but also can you just talk about that a little bit, how you can really do this in an affordable way, too. Yeah, you know... If you see the diet rules on paper and you go to Whole Foods and you get your organic free range beef or chicken and all your organic vegetables, of course, it's going to be like three times as expensive as eating a normal diet, which is really off putting to a lot of people. And what I would argue is that that's the last way that I would buy food now that I know what I know about how to find high quality food for a good price. Right. That's what I do when I'm like, in a pinch, you know, yeah. like, oh, I'm staying, you know, I'm traveling and I'm staying with someone and they have a kitchen. I guess I'll go to the store and buy, you know, health food store priced food. Right. <laughs> you know, that's not where I buy my food. Right. So, so I have a lot of tips for you guys about how you can find food at a better cost. And the first thing I would start with is figure out your budget and mm -hmm. figure out a source for meat. And Buying meat in bulk is the best way you can save money on, on quality protein. Right. Great so a really good way to buy meat in bulk is to find a farmer near you, which a lot of people think, I don't have any farmers near me. But I think you'd be surprised if you look on a website like eatwild.org, which is where I originally did my search. And I found that in the area where I live, there are almost hundreds of farms that wow. raise animals really sustainably. And if you buy a meat and if you buy like say a cow, you, you, a lot of these farms have programs where you can buy a quarter or a half of a cow, which is a lot. You'll need a deep freezer, which is an investment, but you can buy a quarter or a half of a cow and you pay up front and then the butcher cuts it up to your specifications. And then you end up with this like hundred or 200 pounds of meat to put in your freezer. And then you always have it there. Wow. And the benefit is that when I buy meat from my farmer, I, it ends up being about $4 a pound for organic grass-fed meat. And these animals have been treated with respect, and they haven't had to go to the slaughterhouse, which is really important to me, the ethical piece. As being a former vegan, I don't really want to eat animals that you know, have to go through those stress hormones. and. Right. You know, just knowing that the farmer, they, you know, they lived and died on the same property in the field is really important to me. So yeah. the only way to legally do that is to buy an animal before they slaughter it. So by buying in bulk, you support this farmer and you get all of this incredible meat. Um, and it's so much cheaper. You know, if you were to buy organic grass fed, you know, New York steak or something, it's like $17 a pound and right. you get it for four. Right. So that's my number one tip. That's um, a great tip. You can also buy pastured chickens from farms. Chicken is a little bit of an expensive meat. I don't usually eat a lot of it just because it's harder to find good chicken. Um, but definitely buying in bulk is a really good way to go. 
And then my second tip is to choose fattier and tougher cuts of meat. If you have to make a choice between organic and conventional meat, I would suggest buying con lean conventional meat because the toxins are actually stored in the animal's fat tissue. Mm -hmm. So point. buy um, conventional meat that's lean and then buy the fattier cuts of meat that are organic. And those tend to be cheaper anyways. So if you're buying like a chuck roast, you could buy that organic and those nutrients in there, all the connective tissue is actually really good for you. Um, and then another thing that a lot of people are put off by, but I think is really important is you can eat organ meat and organ meat, even pastured, grass fed, organic is very inexpensive just because culturally we don't eat it. You know, it's not in demand. So I buy organ meat at the farmer's market for two to $3 a pound. And I usually eat it a couple times a week. And that just, I mean, that makes my food bill go down considerably, you know. Um, and organ meat is actually really high in a lot of vitamins and minerals, especially fat-soluble vitamins like A and D mm -hmm. that are really important to healing from autoimmune disease. Yeah, it's a very um, good point. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of organ meat. It's kind of an acquired taste if it's something you it haven't really eaten is. before. I didn't like but... it. I, you know, I will totally admit I was yeah. like... I was not into the flavor, but it made me feel so good when I started eating liver on a weekly basis that I, you know, it's not for everyone, but I, I would feel like I was missing out on giving a piece of information if I didn't share that about my recovery because, you know, I didn't recover eating chicken breasts. Like I really got in there and I ate liver, you yeah. know, and it's so nutrient dense that it, I don't think it's a coincidence, you know. Well, right, and it's it, liver is so important for the the conversion of thyroid hormone, for the production of, of many other hormones, and for the so many processes that mm -hmm. are impacted by Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. It's so, so true, and if people are worried about the toxins, like I said before, the liver filters the toxins, but it doesn't store them. The mm -hmm. toxins are stored in the fat. Right. So if someone's worried about toxins, First of all, buy organic meat, you know, right. buy grass-fed, pastured organic meat. Don't buy conventional meat, but be wary of the fat. Don't be wary of the liver, Right. you know, because those, those nutrients, like you said, are going to enable your own liver in order to function properly. And that's what your body needs in order to filter all the toxins that you're taking in, you know? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And then another tip I have is to render your own fat. You know, cooking fat, solid cooking fat is really important. And especially with people that are um, allergic or sensitive to coconut oil, buying bulk fat from a farmer like I do with the liver, at 2 to $3 a pound, you know, and you cook it up and melt it down and put it in a uh, mason jar, strained, and, you know, you have beautiful cooking fat to enjoy. You can roast vegetables in it. Um, and so anytime I cook like a duck, I'll save all the fat and I'll yeah. use it. Or if I cook bacon, I'll save all the fat and I'll use it to cook vegetables. It's another way to save money is to render your own fat. Mm -hmm. um, having an herb garden is really an, a good way. Herbs actually per ounce are the most expensive produce. Because yeah. if you think about it, you get like a tiny little sprig for like three dollars right. and so just think if you had some pots on a windowsill you don't even need outdoor space to grow herbs you can grow your own thyme rosemary basil oregano um kind of whatever you want and even if that's all the space you have um that's a really good option for people that are looking to save money absolutely i live here in los angeles and that's i'm exactly what i'm gonna show people i have a hashimoto's garden with all those herbs in pots plus a lot of these other vegetables in small plots out in my backyard. Yeah, and if you have a little space, you know, you can start a small vegetable garden of yeah. really simple, easy to care for foods. Like I like to do greens, right. so I do a bunch of lettuces and a bunch of mixed greens, and I have some baby lettuce and then some head lettuce, and then I do a ton of brassicas, so right. kale, collard greens. Um, I also do some spinach, and I don't really bother with a lot of the more um, – the vegetables that need a little more maintenance or water. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so it rains a ton here, so that the lettuces and the greens just kind of grow no matter what. They're really right. low maintenance. Like but I'd say wherever you're at, you know, you might be able to find some vegetables that you can grow, and that will definitely impact your grocery bill, you know? Yeah. Wow, those are some great tips, Mickey. Yeah, yeah. I so, actually I you have got more? more. 
Okay. Yeah, I have yeah. one more. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> so joining a buying club, um, there's a if you oh. live on the West Coast, and I actually believe that they're starting to do it on the East Coast. There's a company called Azure Standard, oh. and they do bulk organic delivery. And so what happens is all a bunch of people in a neighborhood go in together and they order like a really big bulk order, and oh. they carry like everything a specialty health food store would carry but maybe in like a gallon quantity. So you can get a really good organic olive oil for like $30 a gallon wow. when really you'd be buying it for like $12 for eight ounces or something at the store. So the community bands together, they have a drop point, they give it to you bulk and in, in big, big portions, but it's a really good way to save money as is um, Costco, which most people have a Costco. A lot of people have Costco membership. You can get things like frozen fish, um, now I've seen organic avocados, berries, produce, coconut oil. You mean organic uh, coconut oil recently. Yeah, yeah, got... totally. They have coconut yeah. products. So they're coming around to the kind of real foods movement. Right. And they're offering a lot more products at an affordable price. So if people are worried about money, um, yeah, I think there are a lot of options. You definitely got to work the system. It, you can't just go to the grocery store and buy all this food and then expect it not to be expensive. Um, but it can definitely be done. Yeah. Wow, those are great tips. Um, since you brought it up, let's just let's jump next to into uh, the goitrogens and the brassica family. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a common misconception. Yeah. I love Sarah Ballantyne, Paleo Mom's new book. She's got a wonderful section in there about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Karazian recently did a, a blog post on this. This is really a myth. It's, I think it's time for us to blow this up mm -hmm. and stop the nonsense about goitrogens. Totally. Well, goitrogens are foods that have been shown in lab studies to impact thyroid function. And what that translates to with normal people eating normal amounts of vegetables is not really any effect. Right. So, you know, Dr. Karazian referenced a bunch of research showing that in the quantities that we eat it and in our bodies, it actually has very little to no effect. Right. And these vegetables, you know, they're actually more than just the brassicas. It's things like sweet potatoes, strawberries, peaches. I mean, all of these foods are very nutritious. They contain vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, like different phytonutrients and fiber that I think are just incredibly important. Even sulfur. I miss sulfur. I mean, that's those are all nutrients that I think are really important a part of a nutrient dense diet and a part of healing from chronic illness. And when you take so many foods out of the diet, I think it's really tempting to say, and then I'm going to take out this category and this category and this category, just because, you know, I'm going to heal myself. But really we have to look at why, why are we right. removing these things? The autoimmune protocol is based on science. These foods are based on science. This isn't based on hearsay or rumor, you know, so I think the goitrogens, um, as long as people aren't juicing cabbage, you know, I think that someone somewhere probably could overdose on them and have a problem. But I think in a regular quantity, you know, having kale, sautéed kale with breakfast and eating a peach with lunch, you know, is not a problem. And I mean, I personally, I've never had a problem with these foods. Um, and I'm perfectly healthy living with Hashimoto's and I know you too Mark have a similar experience right so, exactly yeah, yeah. They're, they're a very important part of my diet again I, I just want to emphasize the point you made they are extremely nutritious a lot of things we need I'm glad you brought up sulfur sulfur is one of the mm -hmm. pathways that's very important for the conversion mm -hmm. of thyroid hormone mm -hmm. but yes we definitely need that and and also really I, you know, I recently did the interview with Dr. Karazian and one of the things he pointed out was really, you know, this is not what's causing the inflammation in the thyroid. Mm -hmm. It's not the goitrogens. It's the mm -hmm. autoimmune process. Mm -hmm. It's the things like gluten. It's these other things that, that are causing, you know, the, the immune reactions in our bodies, not the foods from the brassica family. I you know? agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so another point that I often hear from people is that, and, and this is a real obstacle, and, and it's something I think should be addressed, sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you're living with other people who don't have autoimmune disease, obviously, and they're not going to be supportive, and you're going to have to make this big change in your life, which is really an absolute necessity if you want to get better, 
and you may run into some obstacles with people who are living in your house. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I mean, this is a really probably, I would think, the biggest issue or the biggest obstacle someone could face is maybe a family member or their spouse just really not getting it and right. really not wanting to accept that they're going through this process in order to accept or to improve their health. Right. So what I always tell people is to ask that person really not to try to convince them why or the reasons basically why they're doing this thing, maybe it's the science or anything, but just ask them that for their respect, you know, just say, look, I'm doing this for myself, you know, and this is really important to me. And can you just give me the respect um, that I need in order to do this? You know, um, I think it's, it's hard to convince someone to understand really completely what you're going through. But I yeah. think on that level, a lot of people would understand that and say, all right, you know, I, I understand, you know, this is what you're doing and I'll give you, I'll do the best I can, even though I don't understand, you know, and that's what I've asked people in my life back before they really understand what understood what was going on. Um, to just give me, give me that respect. Yeah. Um, and so um, I've, I've noticed that with people that have a hard time with it, giving them very clear guidelines is never a bad thing. Right. So saying, expecting, like saying I cannot have gluten or I can't be around gluten and then not really explaining what that means, that's not a good idea. Right. You know, you'll want to say, you know, a very small amount of gluten could be problematic for me. So sorry, mom, you know, I know you like to bake bread from scratch every week. Is there any way that during my elimination diet you can buy bread and keep it separate from the other foods so that it's not in, the wheat isn't in the air, you know? And I actually, I had that same situation with a family member who was living with me when I was doing my elimination diet and enjoyed baking bread. And I was having a flare, um, and I couldn't pinpoint what it was because I, you know, I had all my own... Um, tools in a certain part of the kitchen and I had my own cutting board and there was no contamination I was sure but this person was using flour and baking bread and when we figured it out it was kind of like oh you know neither of us really understood how that how it worked on that level right. so I think just being clear and saying this could potentially be an issue you know if you could help me with this um instead of why don't you understand you know and do everything automatically you know there's definitely a different way of approaching back to those kind of issues. Right. I think it's, you know, for all of us, this whole process has required and will continue to require a, a degree of education. Like, we're mm -hmm. always learning more about it. And I think, you know, as you're starting out, as you're, as you're dealing with all of the issues here, there's a lot of education that you need for yourself. And there is also education that you need to share uh, with, with people in your family and, and people around you. Mm-hmm. And, and I think ultimately, too, sometimes, you know, if these people are not going to be supportive, then sometimes you have to, there's a point at which you have to take yourself out of that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm not saying, you know, leave your family or what have you, but, mm -hmm. you know, at a certain point, you have to make your own health a priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another point that's definitely an issue with the autoimmune pre protocol is breakfast. For a lot yeah. of people, all their traditional idea of breakfast uh, it cannot go on while they, especially while they go through the elimination period. Mm -hmm. uh, any points, uh, uh, tips for that? Yeah, breakfast is hard just because people think of cereal and toast and you know, even a paleo breakfast, you know, eggs are off limits. Right. So breakfast is hard. You know, you really need to do a lot of preparation, but I don't think it really needs to be difficult. What I tell people to do for breakfast is make um, homemade meat patties or sausages. Right. And so what you do is take a, a pound of ground meat. So it could be beef, pork, lamb, a combination. It could be chicken or turkey if that's what you like and a bunch of herbs and some salt and you just make up a bunch of patties and you bake them in the oven at 400 degrees for about 20 minutes and then you freeze them individually in between slices of wax paper and and then you know I'll do this like two or three pounds at a time 
So I grab it out from the freezer, heat it up with maybe some leftover veg vegetables, some fermented foods. Um, you can eat, either make your own fermented foods or purchase them at the store. Um, you could do like an avocado. A lot of times I do avocado to get in some of that healthy monounsaturated fat and maybe half a piece of fruit, a mug of bone broth. But really when you start to think of breakfast as how can I get like really winning combination of protein, fat, and vitamins and minerals for my first meal of the day, that's really how you set yourself up for success for the rest of the day, you know? And people can even eat leftovers for breakfast, you know? They could eat leftover meat and vegetables from the night before. They could have leftover stew. They could have pate and plantain crackers, you know? It, you don't really have to eat a breakfast type of food in order for it to be breakfast. You just eat something really nutrient dense. Um, don't skip the protein and the fat. So I'm not a big fan of smoothies unless they have maybe gelatin, grass fed gelatin um, is a good option to add some amino acids to the smoothie and some coconut butter, or coconut oil for some fat. But yeah, there are definitely a lot of options for breakfast. Yeah, I think it's a great point. If you think of breakfast more in terms of your fuel for your entire day instead mm -hmm. of the traditional... I mean, because that's what most people do. A lot of people just do sugar for breakfast, mm -hmm. and they crash an hour later, and then their whole yeah. day unravels. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of... Especially um, if you still have blood sugar regulation issues, the breakfast is where you're going to win that. You know, the breakfast is where you're going to start. It's not the snack. You know, the snack happens when you've already not set yourself up for success and you've got yourself on that roller coaster. But right. you avoid getting in on the roller coaster in the beginning just by starting with a nutritious breakfast. So That's a great yeah. point. That's it. And this is a good segue. This next thing I want to talk about was blood sugar. I mean, mm -hmm. blood sugar regulation is so hugely important for Hashimoto's. I mean, it's, it's closely linked with the adrenal health. It's closely linked to thyroid health and energy. It's closely linked to immune health because if you get all these blood sugar spikes, it can really impact your immune responses. Uh, any tips for helping? You know, a lot of people that come to me are really, and I think a lot of people in our culture are really kind of have become these sugar addicts or, or at the very least sugar burning beings, and we really need to transition into fat burning beings which is really, I think, where we're supposed to be, you know, for, in, from a physiological standpoint. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. And that transition, you know, the first thing to know is that it doesn't happen overnight. Right. You know, just because you had a meat patty and, you know, bacon and bone broth for breakfast doesn't mean you might not be hungry three hours later. You know, it's, it's more like, how many years have you been training your metabolism this way? How many times have you been looking for the cup of coffee or the croissant, you know, or the Snickers bar every time you got a crash, right. you know, and most people wouldn't say, Oh, a few days, <laughs> you know, it's more like my entire life, Years, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. So your body has had potentially decades of training to have that crash and have that way out through sugar and, um, caffeine, which spikes cortisol, which then raises glucose. So coffee, even though it doesn't have any sugar, it fulfills that role, you know, of raising your blood sugar. So um, the way out is to change your diet over time, you know, start eating more protein and fat, start e eating less carbohydrate, which the autoimmune protocol really takes care of that. Exactly. You know, I'm not a fan of eliminating all carbohydrate. I think fruit is really nutritious. I, there's lots of vitamins and minerals and, you know, electrolytes and all in this package, you know, dried fruit can be problematic. Um, and I think a, an emphasis on good complex carbohydrates and starches like sweet potatoes, yams, hard winter squash, parsnips, beets, um, even like taro, um, I think those are all really good choices for carbohydrates for people that are trying to manage blood sugar. Um, and then just trying to make sure that you have a snack with protein and fat instead of one with sugar whenever you have a crash. So 
that would be probably the most important thing for someone that is trying to transition from a sugar burning metabolism. Every time your body wants sugar, give it protein and fat. Yeah. And eventually it will learn how to digest that fat slowly and give you more of an even burn than that sugar that's just going to make you hungry again in a couple hours. So for between meals, like autoimmune protocol snacks, I would eat maybe just a bit baby meal. You know, maybe eat half a meat patty and some vegetables. Maybe take a mug of bone broth and throw some spinach in it and have that as a snack. Um, maybe, you know, olives are a great snack jerky, um, root vegetable chips and pate, um, all of these things are, you know, they're, they're not high in sugar. They're just, they're actual food. And when you start giving your body real food, when it wants energy, it'll start to go, Oh, I actually have this wisdom within me that I know how to store all of this and then give it to you at the right moment instead of, you know, kind of having this crazy ride, you know? Um, so that would be my advice is just to be patient and just set yourself up with a lot of really good nutrient dense food. Great advice. And really, you know, as you make that transition, that's also what helps to burn the fat that you've stored and helps you exactly. to lose the pounds. Exactly. And, yeah. and what a lot of people don't realize about sugar is that it's more easily converted to fat than fat is. So fat actually takes a long time to digest which is why when people increase their fat intake, they actually get less hungry because their body is spending all of this time in digestion, but sugar is digested immediately. And then only a teaspoon of that sugar that you digest is actually used to raise your blood sugar and the rest of it, the liver turns into fat, you know? So all those pounds that people pack on, it's it's not from the fat, it's from the sugar, you know? Right. And and we were talking about cholesterol earlier. Really, cholesterol and some of these lipids that are a problem for people, those are the result of sugar too. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow, great stuff, Mickey. Um I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, okay. Next thing I want to talk about too is just some other practical things like when you go out to eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what? eating out is really rough just because most restaurants have obviously in mind profits over the health of their customers. Right. So most of them today are cooking in industrial seed oils, which are absolutely toxic to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they're serving food that is low quality. So if I, if I need to eat out, well, first of all, the best thing to do on the elimination diet is to try and not eat out. That, I think that's ideal. Um, if you can't do that and you have a celebration or something, I would say a best, the best bet would be to either, I, I actually had a friend when I had a celebration, when I was on my elimination diet, offer to cook me filet mignon for my anniversary, wow. and which was such a nice gift because she knew that I couldn't go to a restaurant and it ended up being great because I felt safe and I knew I wasn't react, going to react to food. Um, so if you have someone in your life that can do that for you, that's awesome. If you don't, find a restaurant that at least is gluten-free or has a gluten-free safe area in their kitchen. And I would say that is a minimum requirement for eating out. Um, because if you find a restaurant, a conventional restaurant, and they say they can make a meal gluten-free, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Um, and so I would be very, very careful at restaurants. And if you do go to a restaurant, you know, call ahead, ask, you know, give them their, the list of foods, ask if the chef can make you something special, make sure that they can keep everything separate. Um, I've had a lot of luck asking for salads and getting like fish or chicken just grilled and served on top of a salad. That's a really great option for a restaurant. And it gets easier the more you start to realize how food affects you. Right. And once you're in the reintroduction phase rather than the elimination diet phase, because then you can go to a restaurant and you can see, well, you know, at this restaurant I ate eggs and it didn't work. Or at that restaurant, you know, I had a little nightshade and it didn't work. But you have more like looser boundaries to play with. Whereas in the beginning, it's actually very important that you don't accidentally have it be exposed to anything so that would be my advice on dining out right i think it's an important point too i mean really 
you need the to go through the elimination phase and be very strict to get a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Cuz that's, you know, before we get there most of us it's we've been living kind of haphazardly and we just have no idea. Mm -hmm. And through that elimination process you you're able to identify things and then you know, you may not know exactly what it is, but at least you're kind of in the ballpark of, oh, okay, I got exposed to something mm -hmm. that's not working for me. And once you start asking questions at restaurants, you and at, once you get to the point where you cook well enough for yourself, that you're, you know how to cook, prepare nutrient-dense foods that are tasty and, you know, helping you heal your body, and then you start asking questions at the restaurant and you realize what they're offering is full of sauces and sugars and yeah. grains and bread and and there's not actually a lot of food served right. at restaurants there's there's a lot of this this cheap fluff right. and um i have become really intolerant just to rest the idea of a restaurant just because i i it's so rare that you can actually get a good cut of meat prepared well yeah. you know enough for me to pay a ton of money to eat it you know right. I would rather just go buy a really nice cut of meat and have a celebration at home, you know? It's true. So We really need a chain of autoimmune paleo <laughs> restaurants. I'm working on it. <laughs> no. Please, 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 please. Maybe someday. <laughs> if anyone wants to open one, I will happily consult them. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, I, I think that's another, you know, it brings up another great point, is like you really have to get comfortable in your kitchen and really start to love cooking. If you're somebody who just doesn't cook at all, it, it, it's really going to be an obstacle to your healing. Like this is something that you have to really embrace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to say that you have to start loving cooking, okay. but I think, you know, you might love your new healthy body and that might make you yeah. like cooking a little more, <laughs> you know? Um, I've met some people who they still don't love cooking after having to do it a lot, but um, there are definitely ways and kind of tricks that you can learn in the kitchen, like especially have really good tools, you know, mm. at your disposal. Crock pot is great. A pressure mm. cooker is great. You know, a high-powered blender is great. And when you have these tools, it just makes your prep time so much less. Yes. You know, um, I, I love cooking. I love raising things in the oven. I love spending a lot of time on food, but I know a lot of people don't. Yeah. So there are a lot of options for people and a lot of resources for people who don't know how to cook. Um, welcome to the crock pot. You know, the crock pot, you really don't need to know how to cook to use one, you know. Throw in some meat, throw in some vegetables and some broth, and eight hours meat later you have dinner. You yeah, know? that's it's a just, great point. It, it, it does itself. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, um, you do need to learn some cooking kitchen skills, but you know, with some um, personalization, you can kind of find a routine that works for you. And you know, I would definitely. Um, make an effort to just kind of check out different ways of doing things and figure out what works best for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great advice too. Okay. And one last thing, just traveling, you know, I have some people who have, uh, you know, very busy lifestyles. They travel a lot for work and they have Hashimoto's and the, some of these people are really the ones who struggle the most. Mm -hmm. So, any advice there? I mean, I, for some of them, I recommend, you know, take a vacation to start the the elimination phase. Like, you really mm -hmm. need to maybe stop for a little while uh, in order to give yourself some space to heal. Yeah, well, what's really interesting is that stress causes leaky gut as, ma as much as food does. Right. So, you know, every, someone could be doing everything right, and if it's stressful, if they've got all the stress in their lives and they're not willing to deal with it, they might not see any progress. Right. So I, I agree with you, you know, vacation to do the autoimmune protocol would be awesome. I, I think I'll, it's not realistic for everyone, but, right. you know, it would be really great if people thought of it that way. Um, as far as traveling for work or even if you're going on a vacation with your family or something, there are things you can do to bring food or be more prepared. Um, I always try to stay somewhere where there's a kitchen available. 
So if I stay at a hotel, you know, bare minimum, a little kitchenette somewhere that I can heat up and prepare food. Um, I always seek out like Whole Foods or a natural food store. That's when I pay top dollar, like I said before, um, for food, just because you're not going to be finding a farmer's market when you're on vacation. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe you are. Hey, let's come here to California, visit us. I know, yeah, I was going to say, actually, last time I was in California, I did that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would grab, you know, some, um, what do I usually do? I usually do like prosciutto, smoked salmon. Sometimes I'll get ground beef and I'll make sausage patties in the hotel and just have them for a few days. Wow. Um, Whole Foods and other natural grocers have salad bars. So, uh, a common, like, even if I'm out running errands in my city that I live in, you know, if I get hungry, I'll go do like a salad bar and then I'll put some prosciutto on top from the deli. And when I go into the deli, I always have them sanitize the machine before they slice the meat because a lot, a lot of those meats aren't gluten free, mm. just so people know um, to ask for that. Mm. Um, and yeah, like smoked salmon, canned fish is a big one. I do a lot of canned sardines, smoked oysters, which have a lot of minerals in them. They're actually really good for you. Mm -hmm. And canned tuna. Um, canned salmon and those are just kind of the default okay I don't even have a kitchen I need to eat something you know I need protein and it's usually the like that canned fish over top of organic lettuce greens or a salad bar salad or something like that um, yeah I, I, I do yeah I think that's excellent advice if you're doing canned fish try to make sure it's BPA yes. free yes that's something we want to uh, be really yeah. careful about. Um, but yeah, wow, Mickey, this is great, great stuff. Thank you so much for these tips. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be using your cookbook, of course, uh, in this course. And in that, there's a lot of really practical resources, some great, mm -hmm. great recipes, particularly some of my favorites are for the patties that you described. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just delicious, and it's really a way of making lots of food all in one, you know, one sitting and then you have you know for your entire week or a couple of weeks uh ready to go yeah yeah that's great and and i have a lot more details in the book about how to stock a pantry all the different pantry ingredients that you might want to consider including that give um, autoimmune protocol food more flavor like there's a soy sauce substitute that is made out of coconut called coconut aminos that i really like a few other coconut products um, herbs and spices and stuff. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of information to hopefully help you not feel so lost and discouraged and right. alone, but feel like, wow, I have the world in front of me. I have all of these foods that I can eat. I've got all these recipes and then hopefully it's all laid out in a way that you guys understand and you feel empowered to change your life, you know? Right. I think it absolutely is. It's laid out beautifully. And, and, Again, I think we have to look at, there's different ways to look at this. We can look at this as, you know, it's a classic thing. The half, is the, half, the cup half empty, half full? You know, really, within these limitations, there's an entire universe if you open up and embrace it. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Mickey. This has been a great, great talk with you. Once again, I, I love sitting down with you because I always learn so much, and, and mm. you really have some wonderful practical tips to share. So Thanks, we're really excited. I can't wait to do it again with you at some point in the future. Great. Thank you so much for having me and good luck everyone out there. Thanks, Mickey. That was Mickey Trescott, author of the Autoimmune Paleo Cookbook. And I'm Mark Ryan, licensed acupuncturist and herbalist from Hashimoto's Healing.com. Hashimoto's Healing.com.